Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Kosky of Fun Day back at it once again, kicking it for you and for yours. And this one, I'd like to thank my ancestors for giving me the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And I also like to thank you, the subscriber, the watcher, the looker. You know what I'm saying? And um, as we go and discuss this um African history, you know, as we go to this journey, why not? Now, this one here deals with the Saracens. The Saracens are also known as the Moors. The Saracens raided Rome in 846, an example of maritime gara. This is written by Tommy P. Nakansky of Princeton University. Introduction. Loras missed the Zeus Paganos. God sent the Avigian Pagans was the Christian explanation for the Saracen attack on Rome, as is found in the Liber Pontifus. The church was corrupt. God sent his revenge through the bands and the hands of the Saracens. Although the term sack is often used to describe the Saracen attack on the city in 846, this is actually slightly misleading, as the assault was not directed against the city of Rome itself, but against two wealthy churches, the Basilica of St. Peter and St. Paul. The pillage must be understood in a larger context of the era of maritime raiding expedition that occurred in the early Middle Ages. It serves as an excellent example of the type of raiding warfare of the Gazar, which the Arabs had a long history. Next, we must briefly study the concept of the raid itself. The Arabic term for it is Gazar, which the term is widely used in many European languages. Raza in French, Raza in Italian, Raza in Portuguese, Raza in Catalan, Raza in German, Raza in Swedish, and Raza in Finnish, to name a few. So this is all the places really, sidebar, this is all the places where they had a Moorish presence at, a surrogate presence, you know what I'm saying? You know, you got to read between the lines. Back to it. The Encyclopedia of Islam defines the term as Gazar as an expedition, usually limited in scope, conducted with the aim of gaining plunder. Gazar itself is an ancient, ancient Bedouin institution that established well before Islam. Common raiding amongst the Bedouin tribes was an important means for the Bedouin to gain camel and maintaining camel herds, a necessity for desert living. Bedouins also raided sedentary people who lived in the desert fringes in order to gain booty and economic wealth. Therefore, nomadic raiding was always well known among the people who resided in the desert sands, such as the Romans. For example, in the life of Crassius, Lewitard, date 120, refers to the desert nomads as robbers. And Amias Marcellus, date after 391, described the Arab habit of raiding comparing to the Arabs of birds of play, which swiftly snap their target and flee immediately. The raids were usually well planned in advance with the use of spies and scouts, then executed systematically. The raid of Bandar launched by the Prophet Muhammad in 624 is a good example. When Muhammad learned there was a rich Meccan caravan arriving from Syria, he wanted to deliver the silver boat to the Meccans by gaining booty. He ordered his numbers companions to scout the caravan in advance in order to discover the number of men occupying it and what goods it carried. Once the Renaissance mission was conducted and information was received, it finally came time to commence the ambush of the caravan. The trip to the battleground was actually covered on camels, which is generally ridden like in Badar, by two to four men sharing every camel. The attack was then conducted by foot or mounted on horses. Therefore, the camel purpose was to mainly carry the man in battle and let the horses rest. The Saracen raids in the Mediterranean are the old patterns of desert raiding, as their purpose was the gang spoils and prisoners who were either sold into slavery or ransomed. The biggest difference of the method of transportation. In Arabic poetry, camels was known as a ship of the desert, but oversea riding the marauders had to use what looked like the camels of the sea, the ship. Therefore, it seems that the institution remained the same despite the changes in means of location from the desert to the sea. In the case of the Saracen raid of Rome, the aggressors never managed to reach the city, and seemingly that was not even their intention as the main targets. The churches were outside the city walls. The raiders simply wanted to take their spoils while out endangering their own lives, and thus there was no reason to attack the city itself. Therefore, the attack was not destructive as the earlier sacks which the cities had faced for some hundred years before. Even so, Rome did not survive without damage. 
The greatest was perhaps the mental more than physical. The Roman and their Finnish allies did not accept such an outrageous, did not expect such an outrageous attack on the city. My intention is to scrutinize the primary sources and compare the divergent narratives in order to trace the origin of the attackers and understand the nature of the raids and the results. This is crucial, otherwise impossible to understand the expedition and block. By doing so, I am able to describe how the maritime ground warfare, the Arabian maritime ground warfare, worked in this case of the air or raid or wrong. And we can extend it to the enhancement of overall understanding of Syrian naval operations in the Mediterranean. The Syrians' interest in the central Mediterranean. After expansion of Islam realm, Islamic realm, which spread rapidly to the east and the west in the century following the death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632, Arabic Islamic conquests decelerated in the 8th century and warfare transformed into academic rating. At first, the new religion power did not present any direct threats to Christianity, the Christian Central Mediterranean. Italy and its nearby islands, apart from a few raids in the 7th century. The first raid of Sicily has generally been dated to 652, but according to new research, it seems to be a misrepresentation of the sources, and thus the first Arab attack is more than likely to have been in the year 667. After the Arabs had established themselves in the lands of North Africa at the beginning of the 8th century, their raids became more common throughout Italy and the neighboring major islands, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. You know, sidebar, if you look at the Corsican flag, it's a black man on there, or more. All right, back to it. The North Africans were not only the only ones responsible for raiding, but their brothers in arms from Malusula also planned their islands, especially on the southern coast of the Frankish kingdom. The importance of these raids lie in the fact that the central Mediterranean islands provided an excellent source of booty for war. Booty. Later, when some of the islands were taken by the Muslims, they served as safe havens and birth for launching attacks even further into the mainland of Europe. For navigational regions, it is crucial to control major islands in the Mediterranean so fleet can have moorage in case of bad weather, as well as a place to revere vehicles and refill provisions. Thus, for the example of Merlis, Sicily, and Crete functioning as key points for crossing the sea and operating through the maritime routes and therefore their possessions directly extended the operation spears of the navies. North African Muslims, under the Amaral dynasty, began their quest of Sicily in June 827. And after years of honorous fighting, they achieved a firm grip on the island by capturing Primero with the aid of Spanish Muslims in 831. Capturing the whole island was not an easy task to the British resistance of the Byzantines, and the struggle over Sicily continued until 902, when the Amorites invaded the last Byzantine stronghold. Despite the fact that the island conquest took about 75 years to complete, it did not hinder further Islamic attacks on the Italian mainland. Bernazini was sacked in 838, and Bari in 840 and 841. The island of Istra, which was in the vicinity of Naples, was looted before the beginning of the conquest of Sicily in 812. The Syrians were hired as mercenaries by the Neapolitans themselves in 835. They were slowly making progress to the mainland. Comparison of the Italian and French sources. Unfortunately, no Greek or Arabic sources are known concerning the raid, and therefore we must rely on the Latin writings, such as the Gesta, the Anna, and the Chronica. In general, the main purpose of the Gesta was to inform the reader about the acts and deeds accomplished by a featured people in chronological and biographical form. The annals, on the other hand, was considered dry, short, regional facts written year by year. The two chronicles, which I have used in the regional chronicles covering local information, arranged in chronological order. I have categorized the Latin sources in two different groups. Group A of a source consists of Liberia Prophets, LB, Sancinius Benedictus Casanias, CBC, Cania Marias Casnias, CMC, and Ioannis Justice Emperor and Neapolitan, or GEN. All of these were written in Italy, and the first two were written soon after the Saracens raid of Rome. Chronicle Marcinus was written at the end of the 11th century by Leo Marcinus, who used heavily the Chronicle and Benedict census as his source. John, the author of a certain part of Gesta and Porta Neapolitan, 
wrote a few decades after the actual Ray, but might have had a chance to question the people who met some of the looters. Group B contained three Frank's yearbooks. Annals of Medini, A B, Annals of Fulness, A F, and Annals of Zaxxas, A X. Even though their date was recorded quite soon after the raid, their narratives appear superficial as I only reported the incident briefly and not accurately compared to Group A sources. Most problematic is that it is written far from the actual location of events and do not reveal the source of their information. Thus, there are significant possibilities that the information was distorted before it reached the monasteries where the annals were written. However, it must be remembered that these annals were a product of regional history and therefore their interest does not lie in the accurate of recording of faraway events. Let us read their account of the Gormo Guana sales. Even so, it is clear as they mentioned the raid on Rome and echo how the Franks saw the incident. In general, Group A sources are detailed and compared to Group B sources thus seem more reliable. In researching the raid of Rome, I did not find an instance where the authors want to make a real distinction between the ethnicities, i.e. the Barbers and the Arabs, or religion to set the point out they were not Christians. The writers attempt to seem to have been purely categorized the attackers as a group of infidels from other from everywhere else, and therefore was unimportant in recording their actual origins or belief systems. The important thing was rather to relate what affected the authors themselves or happened in the territory in which they was living. Thus, this in the generous terms, generic terms like Saracene or Heracene or Hegarene. Saracene is at the serum, you know what I'm saying, and Hagar was the maiden. The label of the adversaries of the East or the South. In the Middle Ages, these terms had biblical connotations. As is thought, the Saracens were derived from Sarah and Hagar. The term Ishmaelite, also from Ishmael, was used, was also in use, but I do not find it in the cited sources. In addition, I find that Group B used the term Maori. According to Pierre Gagard, the term is mostly used in French sources to refer to some of Maori origin or from the Maghreb. However, this statement generally applies to French sources Group B. It does not apply to Italian sources group A, as I had mentioned before. Therefore, in this case, we should treat Franklin sources term as Mari and Sanini as synonymous. Italian authors in group B mostly use the term Saracen, Herigrine, or Africani. In some instances, they refer to Marauders as the son of Satan or Bilal, or Saint of Philly or Bilal, the adversaries of God, Demo Contras. The origins of the attackers. The sources provide different accounts of the origin of the Saracens who raided Rome. For example, the Purple Chronicle, the Papal Chronicles, LP, and the Chronicles of Marciano, CMC, both mention the Saracens originally came from Africa. However, Libra Pontus also said they raided Corsica before storming the city of Rome. The mention of Corsica is interesting as the island went through a serious attack, especially by the Mari of the Duran of Spain during the ninth century. The island played an important role in the battle to control the Tarentian Sea, and therefore was used as a base for launching attacks to the Yurgi in Tuscany in the early ninth century. The Annals of Faluna claim that the looters were Moors, Mari, where the Annals of Zanka asserted they was either Saracens or Moors, or early been the captain Benetimpin. The term Mari is problematic, as it usually refers to the old Roman province of Martina and not to the province of Africa. The group, the source of group B does not clearly state where the martyrs are from. They simply refer to them as Mori, which would indicate Annalusa and the Maghreb. Mori could be also synonymous for Sancini, as writers of the group B sources were not interested in the precise documentation of the four origins of the raiders, but rather used generic terms. It is curious that no Italian source of Group A makes any reference to the Mori. The Neapolitan Bishop Chronicles say the Saracens came to the islands of Ponte, nowadays Ponte, to Milan, Italy. The Severian commander of the army of Naples, Sergius, decided to move against the Saracens of Ponte together with his allies, Amamita, Gaeta, and Sorrento. <clears throat> the coalition sailed against the Saracens and defeated them. 
and quickly moved to the island of Latosum, which was swarming with the enemy, and finally expelled the Saracens and freed the island. Perhaps aggravated due to losses on the ground and military bases, the Saracens returned with a large force, capturing their valuable natural harbor of Missinan close to Naples. According to the Chronicle of Naples, occupiers did not come straight from Africa, but from Primense of modern Primero. The town was captured by African Arabs with the help of Muslims in 1833. The guest of Naples stated that the stronghold of Messina was the place where the Saracen attackers sailed from Rome in 846. The problem with the Neapolitan Chronicles lies in the fact that it is written somewhat later in the actual sack of Rome, thus is between the 9th and 10th centuries. While it's possible that the author had a chance to question the people who had witnessed the events, it is also possible that some have re recalled incidents incorrectly. However, the General Chronicle links the sack of Rome to the Saracens of Sicily. Saracen means more, once again. Consequently, we can point to three different possible origins of the Marauders of Rome. They came from the West, i.e. Yorama, Spain, modern-day Morocco. Two, they originally came from Africa, devastating Corsica. Three, they came from Sicily and made their business at Messian, but were originally of African origin as the invaders of Sicily were many Arabs from modern-day Tunis. The first assumption is problematic because of the Frankish sources, Group B, are the only ones that mention the Mari. Do not, they do not place and locate their place of departure. As noted earlier, the Franks are probably using the term Mari as a synonym, as a synonym for Saracen. We should thus rule out this option. As for the later two assumptions, it's hard to draw any conclusion for them concerning whether the writers came directly from Africa or Sicily. All in all, the information delivered by Italian Group BA source appears more reliable because of their detailed and precise documentation. Therefore, I firmly, I more firmly trust their account of the origin of the attackers, despite the fact that we cannot draw a clear conclusion of whether they were from Sicily or Africa from the sources. The Saracens and Athos and Plotus. Even probably can say that Count Avalaris was an administrator of Corsica when the Saracens arrived. He was the one to alert Rome of their movements. Somehow, Avalaris had acquired information that a Saracens was planning an attack on Rome. He warned the imminent nation facing the city. The papal chronicles inform us that the army of Saracens was formidable, consisting of 11,000 men. 500 horses and 73 ships. This mean on average, one ship will have 158 men or horses in it, a great number indeed. The Arabs were eventually aware of Byzantine naval warfare and translated the war for naval warfare guide of Byzantine Empire, Leo VI, 886 to 912. However, the translation was conducted in the 14th century. And therefore, we cannot make a strong assumption about earlier Arab knowledge. Even though not as much known about the early Arab warships in the Mediterranean, they are probably most used captured enemy vessels in addition built their own ships based on them. In the East, Arabs used Zentine warship called, or the general term of the Arab called Shinni. Fleming itself does not refer to a standard sized ship but it's a general term for various size military vessels, depending on the type carried by a combined crew in the Marines of 100 to 300 men. Classical warships were meant for seeking the enemy ship by ramming. But in present type times, this tactic had changed to immobilizing enemy ships with the ram and capturing the ships using a beak. Another Byzantine war type, warship type was a modern day galley condemn. The main purpose which was for reconnaissance and it's crew around 70, 80 purposes. Proceeding the guard warfare, the agile alley galley seems to be more appropriate for quick missions like raiding. However, the vessel terms of the 8th and 9th centuries are interchangeable, and therefore, drama might also mean a Romanian galley of 50 oars. My intent is not to argue about the terms itself, because the sources never reveal any specific information about the ship types, but more about the amount of crew and soldiers they could carry and sustainable warfare or raiding ships. That's when considering the series and army.
Because when considering the Saracen army and the information given by the Book Chronicles, it appears possible that the author doubled the size of the Saracen army. If it was half of that size, around 5,500 soldiers, 250 horses, it would fit well in a navy of 70 to 80 smaller agile galleys. The Purple Chronicles tells that Abedin sent a letter to the 10th of August in 846 and probably reached Rome a few days later. The Roman response indifferent as they seemingly used to foster, as they used to foster alarms. It is also possible that the Romans did not believe the Saracen would dare launch an attack against Rome. Nonetheless, Roman notaries gathered for a meeting and decided to inform their neighbors, vassals, and allies about the possible Saracen threat. The warning was sent in the event that the Saracen army should actually arrive. The response among the neighbors was apparently the same as in Rome. Only a few answered the call for help. After less than two weeks, Monday the 23rd of August, the Saracen Navy came ashore on a river Tiber close to Odessa. Close to Odessa, the old harbor town of Rome. The Saracens marched in haste to Odessa and captured without resistance, for a citizen had deserted the settlement after blockading and barricading the town. Seemingly, the Saracen arrived did not take the answer the Arsenia by great surprise as they had time to break find the barricade and take leave. Most probably they received a letter from Abedin who was have prepared them what might be coming. It, it is curious that Odessa was abandoned immediately without resistance. The port town should not have been easy prey if it had been defended by a fighting unit because the remnants of the wall during the Illyrian period had been heavily fortified not long before the Saracen attack. With high walls, moats, caliper towers built by Pope Gregory IV, 828, 844. In addition, it is listed in the liberal conference that Gergi made him made, were made against the rising Saracen threat. According to the life of Gregory IV, God hated people. The Harrisons, OBDs, Merogens, have been raiding nearby islands and neighborhoods, which have been given much distress to the inhabitants of Portsmouth in Odessa. However, there is no mention of fighting in Odessa, so it seemed the town was taken out with any resistance. Therefore, it is, it is odd that the Romans did not use the fortifications to repel the disembarking attackers, but on the contrary, decided to abandon the whole fortification and move their defenses further back to Rome. At the second autism, the Saracen forces marched against other Roman port town called Portus, looted swiftly and returned to Odysseum. The word of the Saracen excursion reached Rome possibly on the same day the enemy landed. As the difference from Portus and Rome to uh, Portus and Odessa to Rome is only 20 kilometers. Romans quickly gathered a defending force consisting of Saxon, Ferrison, and a Frankish scholar. They sent this contingent to meet the Saracens. The unit was an Isaac, the unit was an Isaac unit of foreigners living in Rome and consisted of pilgrims and most merchants, but not of professional soldiers. The band of foreigners marched close to Odessa on Tuesday and set up camp. The Saracen noticed the camp and made a surprise attack on it on Wednesday morning. Falling in the attack and losing some men, the Saracen had to fall back. This is only a small skirmish between an insignificant number of men. Later on, Romans, Romans decided to see in more soldiers to help the foreign unit. And with the combined forces they marched on partners to only discover how great the number of Saracens was. They were best forced to make a swift retreat. The contingent of Roman soldiers were due to the city and left the foreigners to keep an eye on the Saracens. Apparently, no significant engagement occurred between the two parties at this point. And both seemed to have well planned their movements carefully. I later suggest the size of the Saracen army was highly overestimated by the Libra Pontus. The Roman army, on the other hand, was probably not much larger than that of its enemies. Nonetheless, it may be mentioned that Rome was responsible for its own militia even though it was normally under Carnelian protection. When considering Rome during the early Middle Ages, it is clear that the city had already gone through a massive change from iniquity and was only a remnant of its past glory. The population was around 30,000 and slightly more in the 9th century, and slightly more in the ninth century, having greatly decreased due to great calamities in late antiquity. The period of the Gothic Wars, 4th to 6th century, Rome had 50 to 60,000 inhabitants. But because of the wars, agriculture suffered and population increased. That's when calculating the only male population available for military service 
we're dealing with an army of 5,000 to 10,000 men. The series of march against Rome. Early in the morning of Thursday, the 26th of August, the Syracuse took the foreigner camp by surprise and scattered them, pursuing them all the way down to Ponte Galleria on the north side of the Tiber. Following the roads via campaign and via Pontus, they marched towards St. Peter's Church in the way the rest of the men arrived. When all was prepared, the Syracuse more stormed St. Peter's Church on Friday morning and carried off its treasures. In the meantime, Romans moved their men out of the city and arranged them in the field of Campus Neos, which is situated between the present day Vatican and Casa St. Angelo. The Papa Chronicle ends there abruptly and leaves the army final encounters a mystery. We can only assume from other sources that the battle was fought and either ended in a draw or a Saracen victory. Nothing dramatic could have happened because the Saracen army was not driven from the borders of Rome. Nor did the Saracen try to besiege the city or take it by assault. The only thing that's clear is that St. Peter's Church was looted and the Saracen left the city marching south of the road of Via Appum. The Annals of Fun is mentioned that the Mori came to Rome to sack the city, but failing to do so, they decided to sack St. Peter's Church instead. The Fun and the Annals also omit the sack of the St. Peter's Church, the St. Paul's Church, excuse me. According to the Chronicles of St. Benedict, the Saracens killed men, women, regardless of their age. The Chronicle emphasizes that also that the Saxons also killed many Saxons. The Saracens also killed many Saxons. The reference to the Saxons probably meant that a foreign unit that had fought the Saracens before the sack of St. Peter's Church. Annals of Bernardini narrates that the Saracens looted everything they could, especially emphasizing the decoration of the holy altar of St. Peter's Church. Afterwards, the Chronicle continued. The Saracens marched up 100, 100 kilometers to the south of Rome and made their camp on a mountain. We are told that some of the men in the raiding party left the group to loot St. Paul's, but were eventually defeated by a campaign army. Interestingly, no one other author refers to this. However, the life of St. Quintus in Labor Provences did not explicitly state that the Saracens looted St. Paul. This is mentioned later in the life of Leo IV where it stated that the Pope restored the damages that the Saracen had inflicted to the church. Here we should follow the narration of Lever Pontus, as is probably the eyewitness account of Lucius Babacarius, the chief librarian of the papal archives. How we should consider these accounts of the sack? Did the Saracens actually threaten the city of Rome? Some scholars have proposed that the Saracens tried to attack the city. I find this proposition unsound because only Frankish anecdotes and unless Fernandez of reference it, and no other sources make a similar claim. We must consider some aspects of the city and the Saracens. First, the Roman walls were built essentially in the Aryan walls that the emperor rarely had built between the years 271 and 275. They went through many restorations during the following century. The most important was used by Maximus during the beginning of the fourth century, by Schisto between 401 and 403, and by Belarus in 536. After all this innovation, the wall was around 19 kilometers long and nearly 12 meters high, having 381 towers and a moat. According to written sources, they were appeared again under the Lombard threat in the 8th, in the 8th century and finally under Leo IV who after the raid of Rome. Liber and Pontus gives some indication about the bad condition the walls were before the, the Saracen attack. As noted, Pope Leo IV had rebuilt 15 collapsed towers. In spite of the fact that the walls were repaired a century before the raid, they were still formidable height and strength and would have been impregnable for an unprepared enemy. Thus, the series would have needed a great number of men, siege machines, to storm the ramparts, but nothing seems to suggest they were prepared for a siege operation. It may have been a considerable number of soldiers, especially if we were to trust the estimate of 11,000 men as the paper chronicle suggested. But as I've mentioned before, I find this to be exaggerated. Thus, when we take into account of the galleys that the Saracen probably used, I assume the Saracen forces were around 5,000 men. It was a large raiding party, but it still did not pose a major threat to the city. Second, the importance, the two churches of great importance, St. Peter and St. Paul, but outside the city wall, making them lucrative and easy prey for looters. Third, it seemed that the Saracens knew exactly what they were looking for. First, planning the, the two Roman ports, moving quickly into important churches, and then taking their leave. 
This is reminiscent of the, the concept of the air raiding warfare Gaza, which is one quickly sweeps through the enemy territory, seize as much as possible before retiring to shelter. The Saracens leave Rome. The Chronicles of Marcus Asino details the movement of the Saracens after their sack of the two Roman churches. They took via Avabin and followed it to the south. However, nothing is said about what the Saracens did after they long after their march. After their departure from Rome, the source indicates a Saracen presence near Fundi, where they pillaged and burned the town. They also moved approximately 20 minutes to Sardinia, where they set up camp. The Chronicles of St. Bernard does not exactly where the Saracens went after the sack of Rome, but it indicates they camped around 130 kilometers away from Senate. The Chronicles of Naples and St. Bernardine supported this by telling the battle of Senate and later also mentioned the capture of funding. According to the narrative of St. Bernardine, the commanders of the Frankish Emperor, Rothar, 795 to 855, followed the Saracens but were defeated. St. Benedict and Naples Chronicle support this, and the former informed us that the exact date of the battle was November 10th. Anticles of Benini reports that Senator's son, Louis, king of Italy, fought against the Saracens himself and lost. However, it is not explicitly stated when and where Louis' defeat occurred. So although it may have been in the same battle, we cannot be sure. The Chronicles of Massini and report that the Frankish army executives left from Spalato and followed the Saracens. Nothing is said about the Frankish troop size, but if really led by the King of Italy, it might have been a considerable size. However, it was not the only unit stationed at the border, and probably not larger than a few hundred or less than a couple thousand men, consisting of local militia and a few professional soldiers. The Frankish and Saracen armies met somewhere in their scene resulted in the infamous defeat of the Franks. First, the Franks probably marched around 140 kilometers to Rome, where they took the Aber Road another 130 kilometers to the south. Maps reveal Rome was not surrounded by any highways that circumvented the city. Really, every road literally led to Rome. The fastest route then must have been through Rome, and thus the total length of the march must have been 300 kilometers. Caesar's armies marched around 30 to 32 kilometers per day. If the French could have marched at the same P, they would have reached Cassia in 10 days. Now, if we consider the Roman churches were looted in August, and the first major battle was fought at the beginning of November, we are dealing with a huge chronological gap. It took for a long time for the Franks to gather the men and prepare for a counterattack. In theory, the Franks of Spadano could have managed to rest the Roman time and they marched there immediately after receiving the morning of our daughters. It is curious they did not do so, especially why it took so long to form any resistance. It is clearly known that the papacy was under protection of Frankish kings, but clearly they failed to provide assistance in a time of dire need. When help finally arrived, it was too late and culminated in the utter defeat of the Franks. The Chronicles of Naples in its different narrative, in its different narrative. Interesting, the most precise narrative of the combat is made in the Chronicles of Naples. It states that Saracen used their customary rules to hide themselves in a narrow defile and wait for the right moment to rush from their cover and storm the Franks. Sinifer, the standard bearer of Franks, was killed immediately, causing the ranks to stagger and moral to collapse. Seemingly, the Franks commander had marched rashly and his horse was not highly spirited. The feat might have something to do with the poor training of his soldiers, which indicated they were a militia rather than a real professional army. On the other hand, the loss of morale had been as, might have been the cause of the loss of the military standard, banana. Those were wholly insignia to the Franks, in a similar manner as the Band-Aid were wholly insignia to the Roman legions. The Chronicles of Naples tell how the ambush and defeated Franks were driven off the field and pushed to the seashore where the navels of Naples and Irene had just landed. After the battle, it said the citizens rejoiced in victory and appeared on their side of Sadia. In the meantime, Neapolitan and African ships were due to the harbor city to defend it. They were repelled by the Saracen attack. They repelled the Saracen attack. It is also said that the Saracen Navy was near the town, but was heavily damaged by the Tempest. 
The citizens had fallen back to the shore to repair their boats and reached an agreement with the Nepalese commander to sail for home with their brother will when the brother will permit. Apparently, the Naples were not eager to go and take the field against the Saracens, and they were content with the agreement as long as the Saracens would not stay in Italy. Intriguingly, this Neapolitan viewpoint view of the incidents that offered the sacrament differed from other sources. For example, it depicts more closely what happens at the battle, telling about the Saracen Navy and its fear of second sentence. In the terms of the narrative, the Chronicle sounds reliable as it gives more information about the events but the information may be may also be intentionally important. It is also possible the Navy witnessed a serious movement in Seattle, and some of the seamen might have been allowed to describe to the author what they seen. On the other hand, the Chronicles discuss matters as important to the author. The Neapolitan writer, which primarily interests is in what happened in the spirits of Naples. A large Sicilian Navy sailing along the Italian coast must have been a menace to the seafaring city, which relied heavily on ships and trade routes. For some reason, the Chronicles do not tell what the Saracen army did inland. Unlike the sources of Monte Cassino, which tell the raiding party were laid waste to the lands in the monastery. This explanation for this may be the firm region's approach that's observable in the Chronicles of Naples. Perhaps the writer did not see it as important to describe what was happening nearby as it was not critical information to the history of the city. However, the Chronicles agreed in at least one thing with the other sources. They stated that the series of vehicles were thrown into, into a terrifying storm by going home or in which they perished. Hmm. Saracens near Mont Cassino in the Monastery Chronicles. The Chronicles of the Cluster of the Monastery portrayed the Saracen movements in its territories. According to the Chronicles, the Saracen chased the remnants of the fleeing Frankish troops all the way to the river Labritz or Lagrignano, where they founded the Church of St. Andrea, which is situated 30 kilometers from St. Neon. Here they burned the buildings, moved a couple kilometers near the nearby Albienus, St. Apollinarian, which they looted. If we are to believe the Monastery Chronicles, the Saracens intended to assault the Monastery of, of my Casanino and still his treasures. At this point, the narrative changed to a holographic phrasing of St. Benedict, who guarded his coastal year and his monks by providing divine protection. The weather had been good until the arrival of the Saracens, and the river line was quickly, was easily crossed by foot. However, a sudden heavy rain broke, filling the river so quickly that it began to flood its banks and become impossible to cross. The Saracen plans were nullified. They're infuriating uh, and forced to fall back to their camp of sin. There we are told they hamstrung their horses and sailed home. After this, another holographic story is presented. When the Saracen Navy found out nearing home, two men appeared in the boat, sending them on the ships. They are amazed and amazed Saracens question who were they? The two men, of course, are St. Peter and St. Benedict, who punished the Saracens for misconduct inflicted on their lands and raised a terrible tempest that smoldered the Navy under them. Saracens state their leave from Italy. Most sources, except for the Annals of Fundus and the Annals of Zantius, shared a similar story of destruction of the Saracen Navy. The Annals of Bedini and the Liberal Pontus and the Chronicles of Naples remind us in the God fearing tone that the wreck of the Saracen Navy was an act of the Lord. But they do not mention the divine intervention of St. Benedict, even not the miraculous act of St. Benedict as an interesting point of other Benedictine Chronicles aside on the Chronicles of Massina and Essence, in the Chronicles of Santa Benedict his Santos, as it would have been an excellent opportunity to praise their patron. It is clear that the latter two are closely related, and that the obvious Leo Minus used the Santa of Benedict Santos as his source for writing the Chronicles of Massina and Essence. Thus, this leaves us pondering how Annicles of Blandini and Annicles of Franzini and Annicles of Santos acquired their information because they do not refer to these chronicles of Monte of Mont Casalino and do not follow its agenda. Even though Monte Casalino is the mother of the Benedictine monasteries. Hmm, we gotta, hmm. Sources say that the whole Navy was lost. Some say only a few men managed to survive. But what we never told was exactly the ship, what had, what we wrecked to happen 
or to what home they was heading. The session is the life of Leo IV, whose author claimed there was, that he had encountered a narration the Lieto that claimed that the Saracens were sent to Africa. The two chronicles of Macazina relate that the Navy was so close to home that the seamen could see the mountains. Reference to the mountains might indicate the Alpines or the rugged Sicilian coast. The coast on Africa and Macedonia and Mazatonia is plain and level compared to northern Sicily. The annals of many tales that some shipwreck crewmen found on the beach might have been on the Italian coach or just intervened detail. As for the visibility of the sea in the good weather, 30 meter high mile is visible from 11.25 nautical miles or 21.0 kilometers. And 305 meters high hill is visible from 67.2 kilometers to the sea. Panoramas and Palermo is situated in Steve Hill, the middle of Steve Hills in this, and for example, neighboring Monorail stands 310 meters high. So the Saracen was sailing from Panoramas, they would have seen the mountains about 70 kilometers away. Another option is the reference of the mountains was invented to embellish the story. Apparently, the Sicilian the Sicilian raiding party did not rush this departure from Italy. They had arrived in Rome on August 846, and perhaps it will leave in April 847. The date of departure is not certain, but it certainly happens that sometime after the death of Pope Segers II on the 2nd of 27 January 847. And after the coronation of the new Pope, Leo IV, some sources say that Leo was crowned immediately following the death of the late Pope. But Leo Pompous proposed that the papal see was vacant for two months and 15 days, meaning Leo was not promoted to the 10th of April. In any event, it is clear that the Syracuse did not want to leave immediately once they had sacked Roman churches. Well, they were searching for more. Their raiding exposition was well planned and not made on a whim. First, they planted Odessa and Portus, and second, they quick strike, they sacked the churches, and third, moved swiftly along to the south via Apollonia, ruling major cities along it. They finally encamped the Sidian, where somebody nearby, or somewhere nearby. It's in here they met their fleet, which probably carried most of their Roman plunder. Comes in here they made their way into the lands of the Monte, Monte Cassino, where they carried out another looting, another attack and looting. Obviously, it took some time to gather booty before returning home, but it's still curious that they decided to stay for so many months. I would like to put forward an explanation of the Macronesium and the so-called closed sea is an excellent description of the Mediterranean Sea during the period of September to October, September, October, mid-April. It's a difficult time to sail. In the period of Macronesium on the closed sea, the weather is often cloudy and hazy and make it hard to navigate offshore due to poor visibility and thus increasing chance of shipwrecks. Anyone who has spent time in Italy or Rome during this period is aware of violent winds and a radiant thunderstorm that occurs certainly. The Saracen perhaps waiting for the end of the bad weather, therefore planning their departure in April. They cannot be have been aware of the poor sending condition that characterized the winter months, as they had been selling the Mediterranean for 200 years. In addition, if their fleet was, was basically a copy of the Byzantine Armada, they had most likely knew the Byzantine sailing techniques was different in periods of that year. These are included knowledge of hazards of sailing in the wintertime. Yet, how did the Saracen have so much deep command of the Italian geography? When reconstructing the movements of the Saracen raiding party, it is clear they knew exactly what they were looking for and how to get to the multitude of places of prey. It was impossible to understand the sources of modern and geographical information sources solely on Italian Latin sources. It is likely that the Saracen either used Italian informants, captured or paid, or received information from Muslim travelers who had sailed to Italy earlier. While we have no information on such captured or paid informants, we do know there was area merchant trading in Italy who spread geographical information. A geographical, you in date 1229, cites a Damascus scholar, Ali Walid bin, bin, Muslim, 810 AD, who had in turn heard the story of a merchant who traveled to Rome at the end of the 8th century or the first years of the 9th century. In many parts of the account is greatly exaggerated, as in areas in Rome, there are 4,000 baths and 1,200 churches. However, the merchant did not travel to Rome for tourism, but for trade. And therefore, most of his account 
is devoted to describing the number of the law and marketplaces, which is paid by White Marble. Most importantly, the visitor named by name the episode of Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, assuming that one of the churches is carrying his name and said that the saints are buried there. Among the letter of the Pope Hydrant, page 795, we find an early indication of Saracen slavery expeditions. In this particular letter, dated 776, Pope Hydrant responds to the Franco's inquiries concerning that Christian slaves sold to some Saracen. The purchase occurred in the port town of Sinamichi of the modern day Sinabicha, which lays, which lies only 80 kilometers north of Rome. But both of these sources testify to the fact that the Saracen merchants were moving freely among the Italian coastline and in some instances conveying geographical information. Another interesting account of a Persian geographer, Aben Karim, date 9-11, who never traveled simply himself, but worked as a master of intelligence officers in the Caliphate province in Baghdad. Later, under the reign of Caliphate Ahmed Zem, 844 to 892, he wrote the geographical account of the world, the, board, the book of itineraries and kingdom. In this account, he gave a brief and probably exaggerated description of Rome, which resembles Jakub's description. Ibn Karabin mentioned that in Rome, there were 200 churches, 4,000 baths, and marketplaces played with marble. In addition, he describes the riches of the Roman churches, stating they have golden statues with eyes made of rubies. More importantly, he also mentioned by name the Apostolic Church of Rome. Neither of these accounts included anything about the sacking of these churches. In Abedin with Barry case, it is unfortunate that we do not know his source of information, despite the fact that the two saints are grouped together in both accounts. We concluded that the main church of St. Peter's Basilica was definitely well known in the Arab world around the ninth century. But when the information concerning the known reached the Abedin, then Muslim, and Abedin, Georgian, Persian. The result of the raid. The Saracen attack was surprisingly successful. They delivered the blow to the Espadana capital of the Western world without great losses to themselves until the tempest finally fell upon them. The churches of the apostolic uh, apostles Peter and Paul were primarily rich in the Pope's long ago and lavish gifts. Yet despite the importance of these churches, they were not protected by the old Roman walls, unlike the legend, the popular Satya. Thus, these churches were easy target for raiders who can break through the coastal defenses. It took a few days before the looters could march on Odessa to Rome, even some time for the Roman defenders to remove and shelter the most valuable portable treasures. Not all could be saved, such as the Holy Altar of St. Peter, which was desecrated by the Saracens, according to Canaanitian Chronicles, or the door to St. Peter's Church. Medieval writers do not relate more specific on what was stolen, but they probably did not feel that it was worth mentioning. Where Lee with Prophets spent most of his space in the biography of the Pope Leo IV, spending out the restorations of the Pope conducted in the donation he bestowed. Another important result of the raid was the rebuilding of Rome and its churches. Leo's greatest mission was to enhance Roman defenses by rebuilding 15 towers and gates at the Lernian Wall. He also closed the mouth of the River Tiber with the tower system, blocking the movement of the river with a chain. This was, of course, it meant to stop the enemies from reaching Rome by ship, as the Saracens marauders had done during the sack of the Roman of the churches. Lastly, Leo carried a formidable project of, verif of fortifying the Vatican with walls in a new district called Leoana, the city of Leo. According to Kronheimer, however, the encirclement of the Vatican with walls was not a new plan, as the Romans considered doing so nearly a half a century before. The Emperor, Lothar I, 795 to 855, was greatly moved by the raid of Rome in order to reconstruction of the St. Peter's Church in the circle in the Vatican. He also commanded his son to launch assaults against the Saracens of Pertabento, which is already in Italy. We may ask whether he made the attack against Pertabento as a punitive action for the raids against Rome, as it is possible that the Benevento Saracens made another strike later in 846 on the borders of Rome. The emperors did not have the resource to send expedition all the way to, to the Caesareans in Sicily, and similar menacing enemy was near. The Benevento citizens were an easy target. 
Syracuse of Italy. So Rome was, the Moors of Italy was an easy target. Not the Moors of Sicily, the Moors of Italy. So there was more already there. Yet apparently the Sicilians did not feel they had adequately appointed Rome. They prepared another attack against the city in 849. By then, Leo IV and Gotha I had braced himself in their defenses. A considerable Saracen fleet was seen in Sardinia, which sailed then towards Pontus and Odessa. A coalition of maritime cities, including Naples, Afro, and Sardinia, had sailed to Rome before the Saracens to negotiate with Pope Leo IV. Apparently, the coalition had learned that the Saracens was coming to Italy and they wanted to unite with the Pope to defeat them. At first, Pope Leo IV was doubtful of why such a coalition had come to Rome, but then he understood the gravity of the situation and was delighted to ally with them. The Saracen Navy soon arrived, and the Battle of Sia was fought. This time, the Saracens were not in luck. The Navy was scattered by unfavorable winds, offering their enemies a great opportunity to strike. The battle turned to disaster for the Saracens, resulting in many sunken videos and drowned vessels and drowned seamen. Those who managed to reach the shore were instantly killed or captured. I mentioned that many, many prisoners either ended up forced laborers constructing the wall around the Vatican or were hanging their portraits in the spot where the Caesarian martyrs had, only three years earlier, had taken a great amount of spoils. Now it was the tiniest time for revenge. After the Battle of Odessa in, in 849, the Syrians did not attempt any new major attacks against the city of Rome. A minor incursion in 870 is recorded in Augusta and Porn de Lim when, strangely enough, Neapolitan airmen were responsible for the raid. The sources say that the Saracen merchants had a pact with Naples and lived in the city, and when they made their raid, later the pact was broken. Paradoxically, Naples had only two decades before. Paradoxically, Naples had hired Saracenians despite the fact they had fought against Naples only two decades before. The raid of Rome in 846 showed how poorly the Romans had prepared for the incoming threat, but now they approve how now prove how quickly they could respond to Caesarian medicine by building new fortification, restoring old defenses, and significant that the Cardinian crown gave Rome essential aid, providing the monastery backing for these building expenses. After the Battle of Odessa in 849, the Romans forced the capture Saracens into the fortification program. They turned the certification of vegetation into a Roman benefit. Conclusion. We have seen a sustain of sources representing different accounts of the raids of Rome, and that these differences depend predominantly, um, predominantly on mostly what was written. Authors were mainly interested in the matter that was closely related to their own spirits of living. Regionalism is planted. Therefore, all narration must be compared with one another in order to create a complete picture of the events. Additionally, the terminology used for Saracens is seemingly different in the French and Italian sources. Thus, we must be careful when reading those different records before making assumptions too quickly about the origin of the Saracens. Despite having varying information, it is plausible to assume that the Saracen raiding party that attacked Rome came from either an old Roman province of Africa or from Sicily. The case is studied widely and hence current scholars' understanding of the Saracen raiders of Rome as well as seriously meaning of communication and acting on the information at the time. The implication of these findings can be applied to the other serious raids throughout the Mediterranean in a period to gather additional insight. I provide an example of maritime ground as shown how the Saracens groups operate on their radio missions in the early Middle Ages. In the same way that the prophet had used informants before his raids in order to plan them, so too did the later Saracen raiders of 846. We learn from the air geographers and popular letters, Saracen knowledge came from information derived from merchants when they visited Italy and Rome. The prophet used camels, the ships of the desert, and his raiding mission. But due to the change of environment from land to sea, the raiders of Italy had to rely on ships, or what I term camels of the sea. While the heirs had long ago mastered transportation in the desert, they had quickly acquired knowledge of seamanship, which enabled them to conduct long range maritime raids. Raiding by sails was obviously much different from desert raiding. It required many new skills, as well as an element of natural knowledge, such as poor winter weather, Mascosium. In the long run, sending away the raiding campaigns less rapid than raiding by the camels have been. Still, the very base of the raid remained the same. The Saracen avoided close contact with the enemy 
The Vern Line ambushed and direct, to direct fighting. They also attacked vulnerable targets, for which they were not well protected, such as apostolic churches. Securing the booty was conducted quickly with the seriously acting like birds of prey as Indian runners observed the Arab raids. At least during a bitter bone, the Saracen force was clearly planning the movements and seemed to have prepared their attack well. Almost everything likely to succeed as planning. First, they equipped them with an efficient and large running force that the Romans and France could not match. Second, they had a strong grasp of Italian geography, knowing where to sail in the march. Thus, their land and naval forces moved logistically and swiftly according to their plans. This is shown by our Bible of Destiny, which they knew was where it goes ashore and the shortest way to Rome. They also knew about the Via Apple, which is the fastest route to the south, the other lucrative targets, which they hit after the sack at the two Roman churches. This is they found an excellent spot for setting up camp, and here they met their ships. Another example of geographical knowledge is exhibited with their rapid expedition to the lands of Monte Cassino, albeit bad weather restrained them from attacking perhaps another major target, the monastery of Monte Cassino. Third, there were very rural conditions in the Mediterranean Sea, and they decided to sail in April when the temperatures when the weather, Mary Cassium, or the closed sea should have been over. However, they were ill-fated as a sudden storm caught them and destroyed them. Briefly put, the Gaza of 1846 was clearly executed and succeeded well as the centers and plundered and swiftly the most important churches of the area. In 1849, in 849, when the raid, when the new raid was conducted against Rome, the city had been much better defended and prepared than it had been three years earlier, which ended up in a serious disaster of the Battle of Otism. The Saracen never again had a chance to overcome Rome. Because of their ruthless and effective and their art of pillaging, they transferred a deeply rooted desert mentality in the areas of the seas. In 846, the Saracens truly had appeared to Rome as the Avengers of God. And there you have it. Now, you can't change to the story. You know, they didn't know where they was coming from. There's the Moors that come from. They even said some of the Moors that came from around, you know, the area where they was at. You know, so the Moors was all over the place in Europe. It wasn't just in Spain. It was in Spain, Germany. You know, like I said, they had, you know, ships. They had a navy. They was in Finland. They was all over the place, even in the Americas. You know, that's another thing I'll tell you about, how they was over here in the Americas and stuff like that, selling it back and forth. You know. But, uh, yeah, this is a pretty good story. The Roman sack, um, the, the Saracen sack raid right alone. You know, how, we destroyed, how they destroyed the churches, you know, and things of that nature. So, you know, there's something new that's not really talked about and discussed. You know, hopefully you liked it and enjoyed it. You know, if you did, hit the like button. Let me know what's up. Peace.